be pretty much our only pre-glued full-length plank. I regret gluing up this last sheet. Uh, it looks like it's going to work out fine for this one, but I already know I can't use the same stock down here on this bottom plank because it's, it's, it needs more shape than that. I've actually got to cut that scarf apart and re-scarf it. Just a little frustrating, but it happens. And I shouldn't have bothered, really. I'm, I'm quite possibly <laughs> just short by the tiniest bit to such that I might actually have to go buy another sheet just for that last plank. Or even, to, not even the last plank, just like the last couple feet of the last plank. That's just the way it goes sometimes. I'll be the first to admit that cutting freehand on a table saw is on the dangerous side. However, I do find it the most efficient way to cut planking for boats, especially light plywood planking. I feel like the table saw delivers the best results in terms of giving me a nice, sweet, gentle curve that doesn't have any hills or valleys. Now there are a number of things I do to ensure that this is as safe as possible. For one thing, I always make sure to try and stand off to the side of the blade as I do my cutting. When I get to the end of my cut, I clear away the scrap away from the blade, and then I wait for the blade to come to a complete stop before I start handling my material back across the cutting area. I always make sure to break up my scraps and get them out of the way. And as I approach the end of a cut, I slow way down, because at that point, I've got a lot less control over the plank. So much of it has passed the blade and I've got very little leverage at the tail end. So by going nice and slow, keeping my fingers well away from the blade, taking my time, I feel like I've made this about as safe as I can for a freehand operation. why I hate working with these these long planks are so unwieldy see as I'm trying to wind it in place up there this one back here is flopping all over the place and I have no idea if I got the attitude right Tell you, you know, there's one drawback to this system, and that is this plank is never going to sit 100% exactly in the right orientation because the next plank isn't there, and that's that little extra bit of thickness that throws you off. Okay, I thought I would show you a little something. The drawback to this system we've been using is that we've been describing the shape of our planks off of these bare battens, and that works okay. But when you got a boat that's got a lot of shape like this, it starts, we start to lose some of the advantages there. As soon as you've shaped a plank to match what it looks like with those bare battens, and then you add a plank on to those battens and bevel it off, we've got a little extra thickness on the top. And that changes the attitude of the plank just a little bit. Now when I'm working with shorter planks, it's not a big deal. I can make up for it. I can fudge it because I've got a little bit of wiggle room with each section of plank. 
So especially if I'm doing it in three pieces, I've got quite a bit of wiggle room because so I've got two breaks in the plank. And so you can tweak that shape a little bit. And then when I fare in the scarfs, I can dial it all in. So in this plank, I had some pre-scarfed stock and I thought, let's just try tracing it out full length and seeing how that affects our finished fit. And so here I've got it dialed in at the back end, got it fitting nicely following our lap line. And it's all laying nice and fair with the planking uh, in the right attitude. And by that, I mean, it's touching my plank lap properly and it's touching my batten down below properly. And it's it's like, it's not flaring off of either one of those. So it's, it's, it's a nice, pretty solid fit for the most part. And it all looks really good up until right about midships. And we start diverging off of the line. And right here, we start rising, rising, rising. By the time we've gotten down to the stem, this end has risen up a full two inches. That is too much to fudge in. If I had left my, my tail ends wider, I could probably pull it off because I could fudge one end up a little bit. I could retrim it a little bit, but I just, I already cut it to full, uh, the finished thickness at both ends. I lost my fudge factor there. So what's the fix? Well, right about here, about six feet back, I'm still overhanging my batten down below a little bit. It, by the time that that zeroes out and I'm not overhanging that batten down below, that's as far as I can go. So over here on this side, it's the same situation. I got it laying down nicely and look at this, it comes out two inches high again on this side. So what we're gonna do, coming back about six feet, what I'll do is I'll just square line right across the top. This rises up high, I know I've got to dial back this plank line back to about here, but I'll do that after it's glued up. I'm not going to worry about the fact that these are totally out of whack here. So then I'm just going to clamp these guys right here, and now we're just going to mark our, our lap right here. And of course I need to, um, I need to add the scarf length onto here and this is our scarf line and we're going to scarf the face of this. We need three inches on here. Like so. And then so we're back to square one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time fussing around trying to dial this right in. I know I'm going to be able to plane it in nicely. So there we go. That's that's the fix right there. All right I thought I would just um park at the old groaning chair here for a minute and talk a little bit about the project so far. One of the goals for this project was to just try and find ways to work faster and therefore more efficiently. When you're trying to find new ways to work faster, the, the thing that I find particularly tricky is that you need repetition in order to find those ways. I mean, you can you come up with an idea, you think it might work, you try it, um, but it's not until you've sort of tried it several times that you really work out the kinks you know the first time you try it you're still fumbling you don't you're not really gaining much time you know you do it a second time you iron out a little kink you do a third time you iron out a kink by the time you've done it like five or six times you've actually found some efficiencies that you can move forward with and unfortunately in the case of a boat you know by the time i've done it five or six times i'm down to my last plank so unless i get to build this boat again i don't really get to benefit from those efficiencies the way I would like to. Now, hopefully the lessons I learn from here, I will remember when I get on to the next project. That's always the trick. And not because I come up with new ideas and whatever things I might have learned before, I don't necessarily retain them all that well. But for the benefit of everybody watching here, you can now learn from my mistakes and my innovations. So one of the things I, I learned on this particular project is Using a fully battened mold, I think, has some really unique advantages. It would have been better if I could have built this with, say, a false stem inside that these battens could fasten onto securely in the right locations. And probably the same thing with the transom. Now, I managed to get them to sort of stay put, but there was a lot of fussing around and, and 
you know, and the back of the stem and the transom itself, we've got a you're going to be peppered with little tiny nail holes where I was trying to sort of get these battens to sit just so. And they never did quite land exactly where I wanted them to. But that said, you know, we we found a workaround. We, you know, dialed in our plank width way up here and carried it back a little ways and we're able to fudge it all in. So that was okay. But still, a false stem and a false transom would have made that a little bit easier. I totally wasted my time pre-scarfing some plywood. I had a plan A which I didn't follow. Maybe I second guessed myself. When I set up the mold here, I had it in my head that I might, I might want to do the garbage as one piece instead of two pieces. So my first mistake was just not, was simply not making a firm decision on that. I kind of said, hmm, maybe I want to, maybe I don't want to. And one of the things I thought of is if I did want to, I would want the garbage planks scarfed up full length right away because it's going to be a wider joint because there's a lot of twist in it. it would be hard to glue that scarf in position on the boat because of the width of the scarf or the you know the breadth of the of the plank and uh, so i pre-scarfed one sheet thinking i would get both garbers out of it that is i got two two half sheets and made one 16 foot long two foot wide panel and uh, when it came right down to it, I, I did a little quick spiling of the garbage shape and I immediately realized that there's just way too much shape in this garbage to get it out of, to get both of them out of the one half sheet of plywood. It wasn't going to fit. I'd get one out maybe. So then that means like a full sheet of plywood for each garbage plank, which sounds kind of wasteful. Maybe it isn't in fact, but anyhow. Um, I didn't have that second sheet glued up and I just, I, I abandoned that idea. But what I didn't do was take that sheet of plywood and just cut it in half. I thought maybe down the road I would get to like a midship plank and I, it would be straight enough that I would be able to just get some full length planks out of that and that didn't happen either. So I, I threw myself a curveball right off the bat and didn't follow through with something that would work. Plan A was... Uh, the garber decide was to just take all my planking stock and rip it down to a consistent width that would accommodate any any given section of plank and then just go ahead taking pieces off the pile and hanging them on there and marking my plank shape out and cutting them out uh, and I didn't do that. What I did do was I started goofing around with a section of uh, a, with just like a, a four inch wide length of planking that I was using just like as a straight edge and I would lay it on the boat and I would try and measure out exactly how wide a plank needed to be in order to get it out of that portion of the boat and then go and cut that and it, it meant I was sort of pinching those plank widths down to like you know six or seven inches or something like that in retrospect it was a totally stupid thing to do because it was a lot of farting around just going hmm, what's it what's gonna fit is this gonna fit here gonna get six inches here gonna get six inches down there one thing that probably would have been really worthwhile if I had just bought one extra sheet of plywood and just ripped everything to like eight inches would make sense because you know the sheet divides up evenly into eights. By pinching I might squeeze one more plank out of a width of plywood but you know what's the point of that? It, it, it's silly. If I just cut it all eight inches wide I would have gotten it all on much faster and easier without screwing around because that sheet was was basically occupied being scarfed into a big long panel uh, I, I was running low on materials and so I went and found some old pieces of six millimeter ply from a previous project. It was already pre-scarfed to about 12 feet long or 10 feet long something like that. So I used a few pieces of that because I figured what what the hell you know they're gonna they're gonna fit I can use them but the long and the short of it is is I ended up with like a bunch of scarfs that are like parked right next to each other like one plank and then the next plank the scarf in a row which technically you're not supposed to do but to be honest, in glued lobstrike plywood, if you do a good job of gluing those scarves, it is perfectly strong enough. There's no weakness there at all. In fact, the planking is stronger at the scarf. So traditionally, you would never put scarves or butt joints in line because there's, there's, there's an assumption that's a weak point and you want to spread those weak points out. So in this type of construction, we still kind of follow that tradition. It's expected that you follow that tradition, even though it 
really doesn't make sense. If somebody ever strips this boat down to bare wood, they're going to look at it and wonder what kind of amateur was uh, building this thing, putting scarves close together. And there's even one plank with, with a double scarf, but <laughs> it's just like a, a three inch long plank between two scarves, which is a bit embarrassing in some ways, but you know, it's not a, not really, structurally, it's not a big deal at all. All those things caused me to sort of jump through a bunch of dumb hoops that slowed me down. And in the end, I still had to go out and buy another sheet of plywood. And this time I smartened up and just cut it into eight inch wide pieces to get my sheer planks out of. And if I had just done that from the start, I would have been ahead of the game. Not by a ton, but I probably would have shaved off a couple hours of fussing around collectively. So that was the one big dumb thing I did. Like I've left these particularly wide. I've gone like a full half inch width extra partially due to laziness and partially because I wanted a bit of wiggle room to play around. It means the routing is a little bit slower, but not a lot. The battens want to flex a little bit. By the time you're getting down to running the, the router along the batten, you don't want a ton of material coming off the plank because the router wants to bite in a bit harder and it, it'll pull. So I use this technique where I work backwards, do a climbing cut with the router enough times that I, re I reduce the the final cut down to like say an eighth of an inch or something like that and then it runs much smoother and I find a climbing cut by its own very nature it doesn't like it doesn't dig in deep because the cutters rolling outwards instead of inwards it's more dangerous in a way but not so much with a small router with a big router it can run away on you very easily and cause problems but with a small router you you know it's easy to to overpower it and control your cutting that way. So that works fine. One thing you need to be conscious of is the fact that sometimes that the router's always running square to the face of the planking, but these battens are not always square to the face of the planking because they, they've got twist in them and it's hard to get them exactly so. Sometimes they don't want to wind down to follow the mold exactly. Sometimes that plank edge is protruding above the stringer a little bit. And for that reason, you need to set your cutter a little bit deeper. But in doing so, you clean off some of the surface of that wood or the batten and you expose fresh wood so that when you are going to your, do your glue up, you could be gluing yourself to that batten by accident. So for that reason, I had this little piece of sheet metal that I've been using, tucking it under the edge of the plank and just taking my uh, waxy rag and just giving it a quick wipe down with a paste wax before gluing up just to make sure I didn't leave any exposed wood like that. So that worked really nicely. Another thing that worked interestingly uh, well was taking the finishing nail and tacking it in just at the leading edge of this hood end of the plank where it needs to meet the stem. And that's just because I'm down here. I can't really feel if I'm in the right spot. And it, it made for a sort of an easy way to sort of slide it into position and go, whoop, there it is. It's in the right spot and I can concentrate on clamping this thing in place more quickly. I mean, I might need a little bit of doctoring up, but because there's glue all over the place, we don't want to monkey around with it too much. We want to be able to sort of get it on there and have it stay put. The Omer gun, the, the Raptor nails, huge time saver, definitely worthwhile. Of course, you end up with a bunch of little nail holes in your planking, but oh man, just being able to go bang, 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 and tack those in place, being able to use it to quickly tack a batten in place without having to fart around with clamps and things like that, especially here when it comes to trying to cut your gains and putting a, a guide batten along there, trying to get a clamp in these areas, it's really awkward and using the nailer really sped that up hugely. Just a side note, I took the Raptor nails that are intended to be used in the Omer gun and I tried them out in my Porter cable gun and they seemed to work pretty good. The other big thumb thing I did was I didn't have one more tube of this stuff. I used some of this on the 2.4 meter project and it was the, the volume I used there was probably exactly the volume I needed to finish this job. So the whole planking process, except for the garber to bottom seam, came out of two cartridges of this stuff and two cartridges of the Thixo, the, the low viscosity. So that's pretty good, I think. Um, I'd say reasonably efficient given how much time they saved. And they really did save a lot of time because on the last plank, I had to switch to a hand mix for the, uh, the port side. 
and I was just like, oh my God, this is like so much slower. <laughs> just farting around, adding thickeners and stuff like that. I mean, I'm used to doing that, but just like having that contrast, having just gone land, slammed on the epoxy on one side and then had to stop and goof around for a while on the other side. I really noticed that. Huge time saver was the wet out using the low viscosity epoxy in combination with this little innovation I came up with, which is attaching a little acid brush to the uh, mixing wand, using that to apply the unthickened epoxy to all of my plank edges, especially the ones with the exposed end grain. That was a big, big time saver. I think you could get the thickened epoxy to work the same way if you can use like a pastry bag tip or something similar to that that you could put onto those mixing nozzles. And I am envisioning one that's like a slightly firm rubber one with little notches in it that opens up just enough that it lets epoxy squeeze out. And then the notches would spread it out as you go. And using a single little spreader that I, like a wooden one or a plastic one on the end of the nozzle, it worked okay, but it was always just a bit awkward. Maybe if I just played with it some more and tried some different bits of plastic and tried bending them a little bit to get the configuration right, I'd get there. But I just decided to just go and hose on that thickened epoxy in a bead and just come along with a little comb and rake it all out. The other thing that was really worthwhile was putting those little location blocks onto the hull using cyanoacrylate. Using masking tape as a substrate for it means that it all came off super easily without damage and it held on well enough for what I needed it to do, which is just sort of give me positive registration for those planks. Leaving those scarfs rough, as in the, leaving the widths rough so that one plank might project a little bit above the other one, you know, cut a bit wide, and then fairing it off later with a rabbit plane. I think that was a, actually a, a pretty good time saver. I can just cut it rough, slam it on the boat. I don't have to worry that things aren't 100%, 100%, and they probably are pretty close to 100% using those blocks, but I don't have to worry about it so much. Next day, take the, the rabbit plane and just shave her down a little bit along that edge and dial it in, and, and that worked great. Working smart is primarily about being able to think a few steps ahead to anticipate what you're going to need. A great example is the fact that I knew I would be needing a backing block for all of these scarves. So by making backing blocks up ahead of time and taping them directly to the mold where the scarf is going to land, it saves me having to fumble for them later on. And it also allows me to just use a small clamp pad that I can nail directly over those scarves with our polymer nailer. Now probably the smartest way to work is to not constantly innovate the way you see me do, but it's to find techniques that make sense for the way you want to work and then refine those techniques until you're very efficient at them. That's what you see me do in this video about building skin on frame kayaks. I use just about the same knots, lashings, and joinery regardless of the style of kayak I build, and that allows me to work very quickly and efficiently. So join me again next time when hopefully we'll work smart in the next episode of Building the Catalina Wary. See you later, folks.